thanks everyone for coming out. Um, I'm currently in the middle of my master's project. Uh, I started my first field season here this spring. Uh, and what I'm looking at is developing management targets for grassland songbirds. So uh, I don't have any results today. Uh, we're just kind of in the middle of working all those out. But I'll just give you a quick overview of what I'm doing and then hopefully at some point I can maybe give an update on, on what I've found. Uh, so my work is with grassland songbirds. These are the small size birds that you see in the prairies. I got a few examples of them up on the slide here. Uh, they get their name because the, uh, each spring the males, they'll sing a song in order to attract a female, so that's why they're called songbirds. Grassland songbirds are considered to be one of the most at-risk bird communities within North America. In Saskatchewan here, there's five, uh, five species that are listed as species at risk. They're the Sprague's Pippet, the Bobolink, the Baird Sparrow, uh, the chestnut colored Longspur, and the McCown's Longspur. But as a whole, nearly all of these species from this group are facing steep um, continent-wide declines. So the thing about grassland songbirds is each one of them has their own specific habitat preferences. So when you're determining management targets, there's no blanket solution. You uh, almost have to manage each one specifically because some like very short sparse grass, some like very tall thick grass. Uh, so I'll just kind of begin with uh, some of my work. It's kind of split into two parts. The first part that I'm going to talk about here is just examining how habitat selection for some of these grassland songbirds varies along the north-south moisture gradient and how this applies to identifying regional management targets. Uh, so moisture plays a key role in determining the type of habitat that is available for grassland songbirds. And across the prairies there are a couple of major trends. So kind of going from west to east, moisture increases and this is due to the Rocky Mountains and the rain shadow it creates. But precipitation also increases as you move from south to north. So along the U.S. Canada border, it's much drier, and then as you move north towards the boreal region, you get a lot more precipitation. So this increase in precipitation has a major influence on the type of habitat that's available to these birds. Generally, as precipitation increases, you see an increase in vegetation height and density, as well as an increase in uh, woody vegetation, such as trees and shrubs. So this is just a map of my study area here in southwestern Saskatchewan. Um, these, this moisture gradient creates three uh, major prairie ecoregions. That's the moist mixed grassland, which is the reddish area at the bottom there, and then the mixed, or the mixed grassland at the bottom and the moist mixed grassland in the middle there. And then at the furthest north of that square is the aspen parkland. So this is just kind of a close in of that study area. And as you can see, the blue areas are the areas that receive less precipitation. And then the orange and red areas are the areas that receive more. So as you move from south to north, you see that increase in precipitation. And if the map was a little bit further on the, um, towards the right there, you'd also kind of see the same trend. The reason I decided to choose the north-south moisture gradient is there's just a lot uh, more intact native rangeland in this area. As you start to move further east, you get into more agricultural land, um, and there's a lot less suitable site sites. Uh, the one exception kind of is the Cypress Uplands, which is that area in the bottom where you see a lot of precipitation. But this isn't very typical of the prairie region, so it was kind of excluded from the study area. So the main obje objectives of my project were to determine um, how habitat selection is influenced um, by this more south moisture gradient for some of these priority grassland songbird species. So I want to find out, are um, species preferences changing along this moisture gradient? Do they always select for the same conditions? Or as um, conditions are, are getting denser and thicker, whether they start to um, select for new, um, more important characters. So for example, does a bird always select for that certain vegetation height? Or as vegetation height is increasing as you move further north, are they always picking that area that has the greatest height? And then uh, secondly, I'm looking at a wide variety of species, so I want to compare um, each one that I'm looking at to see which species have similar habitat preferences, which ones have very different um, habitat preferences, and that will help me uh, when making my management, uh, recommending my management targets. So I'll just give a couple examples of some of the species I'm looking at. The first one is the Sprague pipit. So this species has a, a very broad range across the prairies. It's found um, almost completely throughout. 
So one of the things I want to look at is why is it so different compared to some of the other species? Is it more of a generalist? Can it just tolerate a much wider um, array of conditions? Or is it finding those ideal conditions no matter where it is kind of along that moisture gradient? And I have here listed just a few of its habitat requirements listed in the recovery strategy. And if you read through them, um, a lot of them are very general statements. So some of the work that I'm trying to do is to put some exact values to, to, to some of these just to make it easier for when you're management, managing on the land, what you can strive for. So for example, Sprague's pivot likes limited woody vegetation, but if you were to go out and try and manage for this, what does this mean? So I'm um, out there collecting some measurements, trying to determine what is that um, ideal threshold for woody vegetation. And there's a, a wider variety of other stuff that I'm looking at at the same time. So at the bottom there, I just kind of have a picture of you know, your typical nesting habitat for Sprague's pivot. Uh, it may be difficult to see because the picture is pretty small, but there is a nest tucked away underneath all that litter in the middle of that picture. And this is typical Sprague's pipit, like kind of the taller vegetation with a lot of litter to conceal their nest. So if you compare this to another one of the species I'm looking at, it's the chestnut color longspur. Um, the range of this species is uh, much more restricted. It's typically only found in the southern portion of the province. So I want to look at what are some of the habitat variables that's causing this northern limit to its range. Are there certain vegetation characteristics that exist in the northern prairies that exclude it from using these areas? And then by looking at um, some of the habitat requirements in the um, recovery strategy, you can see, aside for the size of pasture that it can utilize, it's very similar to the um, Sprague's pipit, which we know isn't true because it's not occupying all, the, all, all these same areas throughout its range as the Sprague's pipit. So I'm going to try and identify what are some of these more specific things that it's queuing in on. And uh, just to give an example of this, in the bottom, this is kind of a picture of where a typical long spur nest would be. So the vegetation is much shorter than what you'd see for a Sprague's pipit. There's not a lot of litter. And it's actually using uh, some of this alternative sources of cover to hide its nest, like the cow pie and then the plant on the top there. So then the ultimate goal is, by answering all these questions, I want to be able to derive management targets for each of the specific habitat variables that I'm looking at and then um, apply these to some of these priority species. So in order to determine management um, targets, I have to look at the relationship between the habitat variables we measure and then grassland songbird abundance that we see at these specific locations. And then once we find out kind of what is the range of values for each um, habitat variable that a species can exist in, uh, I want to take a closer look and see where exactly does peak abundance occur for that species. And that's kind of where you want to set your management because you want to get the most species um, most efficiently. And then again, just going back to that moisture gradient, I just want to see if um, habitat selection is constant along this gradient. Because if it is constant, the management targets that you design can be applied to the entire region. But if you find out the habitat preferences do change along the gradient, then you have to start um, kind of tailoring your management targets depending on the specific region you're in. Which isn't ideal, but it's something very important to understand um, when you're expending all these resources to try and promote some of these grassland songbirds. Um, so in order to do my work, um, what I'm um, in the process of doing, I've, well, well I've done in my first field season, I'll do again next year, is to go and conduct a series of grassland bird surveys at a variety of locations throughout southwest Saskatchewan. And what I'm focusing on are mostly native rangelands. So these are pastures um, that are PFRA pastures managed by Ag Canada, community pastures managed by the province, as well as private land, and some of these private grazing co-op systems. And what I've done is I've spread kind of all my study sites um, all along this moisture gradient in each of the three prairie ecoregions, just so I can get the widest possible variety of habitat that I can hope to achieve. So then after going out and doing all these bird surveys, what I do is take um, a bunch of specific measurements at each location. So I'll just go over kind of a few of the things that I'm looking at and that um, are known to be important to grassland songbirds. So the first one is vegetation cover. Um, what I uh, look at is kind of the percentage of grasses, forbs, and shrubs uh, within a sampling area. I also look at the proportion of native versus introduced plant species. And then I look at some of the other cover types um, present, such as bare ground, uh, dead vegetation, uh, another one that I look at is uh, visual obstruction. So this is based on uh, plant density. 
and its ability to conceal the birds while they're nesting. So you might have very tall vegetation, but if you don't have very thick vegetation, it, it's very poor at concealing nests. So this is just another measurement um, that I'm taking. And it's done using kind of a standardized process with what's known as a Robel pole. So it's a black and white pole. Um, in our case, it's got um, alternating markings on every centimeter. So what you do is you stick this pole wherever you want to take your measurement in, and then from four meters away, you just record what is the lowest mark on that pole you can see. And this allows you to compare a variety of different areas. Uh, another thing I'm looking at, because um, it's important for prairie birds, is shrub density. So um, in order to do this, I've kind of uh, used the line intercept method, where you walk a predetermined distance and you just count the number of shrubs you, you see along that line. And also by marking kind of the start and end point of each shrub kind of a, along that measuring tape, you can get an idea of percent cover as well. Uh, another one that I look at is cow pie density. And you might wonder, well, what do cow pies have to do with grassland songbirds? But I kind of um, alluded to this earlier that some of these species will use um, cow pies and any available cover in some of these short sparse areas. But even more importantly, cow pies are a good uh, representation of the grazing history of an area and uh, how intensively it might have been grazed. Because as you'd expect, if you have more cows in an area, you're likely to see more um, cow pies. And for that reason, it might actually be the grazing intensity that's uh, more important than grassland birds than the cow pies themselves. I also looked at uh, vegetation height and litter depth. So litter is just all that dead, unattached plant material that's accumulated at the plant um, soil surface. Uh, and then the last one I'm going to go over here is uh, litter mass. So we determine this the same way as you would for a range health assessment. Uh, we gathered all the litter within a 25 by 25 centimeter square and then compared it back to this reference chart. So this gives you a rough estimate of what the pounds per acre in that area are. And at the same time, uh, I've also taken the samples back and we're drying them and weighing them just to see how, how well this actually compares to what's out there and which is kind of the better um, way of determining the relationship for, relationships are for these birds. So if this does work, it's a lot easier just to go out and use this chart rather than go out and measure some of these uh, litter. I think this is an important one too because it's not something that is traditionally used um, as far as biology goes. It's more of a range ecology type variable. And I think um, trying to identify some of these variables that might work for grassland songbirds is very important because a lot of range matters can relate to stuff like this, whereas if I go out and pick um, variables that are strictly um, from a biology point of view, the people that are actually implementing some of this stuff on the ground, it might not be as familiar with them. So for this reason, um, I'm always interested to kind of speak with ranch man or range managers and get an idea of what are some of the cues they look for on their properties, just to see if there is any relationship between some of the stuff I'm looking at as a biologist or whether there's any new things that I haven't thought of before that, um, that we could look into and see if they do apply to grassland songbirds at the same time. Um, so the next part of my research that I'm going to go into is just um, examining the potential for greater sage grouse to be an uh, umbrella species for some of these grassland songbirds. So as uh, many people from the area know, um, greater sage grouse is one of the most intensively managed and uh, well-studied species in the area. And this is just due to their low population numbers and their high conservation priority. Uh, and because of this, a lot of work has been done to identify critical habitat for these species. And this is based on lex sites, which are sites where uh, breeding males attract females, as well as some remote sensing data for some of these important characteristics that they um, require. Um, Greater sage grouse has been proposed as an umbrella species. And this um, means it's a species that by conserving, uh, focusing conservation efforts on it, you're also conserving a wider variety of species kind of underneath it. Um, but this has mostly been kind of for other species that require sagebrush habitat. Um, the idea here is that grassland songbirds <coughs> typically avoid sagebrush. But the one unique thing kind of about the sage grouse range within Canada here is that it's dominated by a silver sagebrush as opposed to big sagebrush in the states, which is much taller and more robust. So because the silver sagebrush is um, less um, proliferant on the landscape, it is possible that some of these grassland species will kind of be using the same type of habitat. Um, so the first kind of objective here is just to go in and characterize what songbirds are using this um, sagebrush habitat, and maybe looking at what species are absent 
And then once you kind of can determine which ones are coexisting with the sagros, uh, you can start to identify priority species where you can manage the two together instead of um, focusing resources in two different directions. Um, and to do this, uh, what I'm doing is comparing abundance within these critical habitat areas versus areas um, outside, but kind of immediately next to it. And then I'm also looking at some of the same habitat variables that I mentioned earlier, just to see if there is any difference between the habitat in, in some of these areas marked as critical habitat versus some of these areas outside of them. And then this will hopefully help to explain kind of why you're seeing some of these grasslands songbirds. Um, so this is the study area here. It's just the south of the, the divide area. And the reason for that is just because this area contains all the greater sage rose critical habitat here in Saskatchewan. Uh, and then just quickly some specifics about the study. Uh, I've separated the critical habitat into three different types based on sage rose density. And this is because sage rose um, don't use um, the same type of habitat for every part of their life cycle. They do some, use some of these um, more prairie-like um, habitat types for certain parts of their, um, uh, for certain seasons throughout the year. And then I also examine um, grassland bird abundance in some of these areas outside of the sagebrush um, habitat, so within 3.2 kilometers. Of and then to finish off, I'll just go over kind of some of the management implications that I hope to achieve out of this work. So the first one here is just kind of um, beginning to bridge the gap between conservation and the ranching industry. So ranching has um, been very vital to some of these grassland songbirds. It makes up um, a lot of the remaining native grasslands that still exist today. And, and without these lands, it's very unlikely you would see some of these birds still at the same time. So it's very important to to just see if there's anything we can tweak to maybe promote these grassland songbirds a little more, but at the same time, not having any negative effects on the ranchers and kind of ticking them off so that they're not um, big fans of the grassland birds. Um, it's also could be used for best management practices on kind of provincial and federal lands, such as community pastures, which would give them kind of, kind of a dual purpose. Um, the management targets could be implemented into a results-based conservation program, similar to what SODCAP is doing. So some of the work that I'm doing will hopefully um, be able to provide some recommendations for what, what they're trying to design as targets. And then, as I showed earlier, some of the habitat preferences in the recovery strategies is very general. So by going out and trying to determine specific values for some of these um, habitat variables, it'll kind of um, improve the recovery strategy even more. And then lastly, kind of on a bigger picture, um, working with a wide variety of grassland songbird species. So as you're starting to get an idea of the habitat requirements for all of these ones, you start to identify what species have similar habitat requirements, which ones have very different habitat requirements, and work this kind of into the bigger picture on managing a, a, a wider variety of species all at the same time. So determining what areas you should prioritize for one species and what areas you should prioritize for a different one. So that's my presentation here today. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone might have, anything that I didn't do. Really, 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 really. Any questions? Yeah. Um, so we've received some comments on the SOD action plan over the last couple of months about multi-species habitat requirements on, the, on a single landscape. It's, you know, people are saying, this is a problem, like how do we do this? And, and um, I see that your project is addressing that kind of a question. <coughs> but from a conservation point of view, or just a, a broad conservation point of view, do you think it is a problem that these species have different habitat? characteristics um, in terms of recovering them. It is definitely a major difficulty here. I don't think it's a problem, but I think once you start trying to manage for too many species in too small of an area, then you start to run into a, a problem. Because um, some of these grassland songbirds are like completely different stuff. So if you have like a, some of the long spur types that like the really short grazed off areas, and you're trying to manage for like a bobolink that likes the really all vegetation at the same time too. Um, it's just not possible to have them both in the same area. So just by identifying which species um, 
are exclusive of one another, I think is very important when you're starting to kind of put in these multi-species plants. But from, I mean, if the real goal is to maintain the grasslands that still exist, right. will that be enough? Uh, the stuff that still exists? Uh, will that be enough to help recovery, or do we really have to micromanage for this species versus this species versus this species? Am I, I don't know if I'm being clear, right. but, yeah, you I'm, know, I'm wondering about these, the, the, you know, do we really have to do multi-species management for the, each individual species and make decisions about who's going to win over who? You know, which species are going to take priority? Or is it simply enough to make sure that there's no, you know, that we don't continue to lose grassland? Right. Um, I think the most important thing is just to ensure you don't lose any more grassland because then you're, you're just going to be worse off than you start. Yeah. But for as far as micromanaging goes in that, I think by monitoring these um, species and identifying which ones are on steady declines and you're very likely to lose in the not too distant future, then you have to manage for those ones. But as far as micromanaging, you can't really expect to manage every single species at once. And some of it you just have to kind of let uh, natural vari variation take into, into account. So a lot of these pastures, even just having cattle grazing on them, it creates a lot of that natural vari variability. You get some areas where they like to graze, um, so you're going to get some of those species that like those short areas, and you're going to get some areas where the cattle avoid as well. So I think by um, trying to protect large blocks, you just naturally get some of that variation with that. Yeah.